Everybody knows the phrase, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Obviously, it's not literal. We're all actually from Alpha Centauri. An American ecologist named Dr. Ellis Silver claimed to have spotted a few telltale signs that humans did not originate from Earth and that we're actually beings from another world. There is a pretty well accepted theory out there that organic matter may have been delivered to planet Earth by meteors, perhaps as single-celled organisms or just as the building blocks of life such as amino acids. But Dr. Silver went one step further, that we arrived as fully formed complex organisms between 60,000 and 200,000 years ago. Perhaps we interbred with Neanderthals, and perhaps we're just straight up aliens. All Silver knows is that there are some things about our physiology that just doesn't add up. Citing everything from sunburn to childbirth in his book Humans Are Not From Earth, a scientific evaluation of the evidence, Dr. Ellis Silver points out all the things that seem to contradict the idea that we evolved over millions of years in our Earth environment. Who knows, perhaps Earth is even some kind of prison colony, and we've been sent to this little galactic backwater to learn our lessons while the rest of the universe zooms around in lightships. Granted, these theories should probably be taken with a healthy pinch of salt, but let's indulge in the good spaceman doctor for just a moment. I'm Cal from WhatCulture.com, and this is 7 Reasons Why Humans May Not Have Come From Earth. Number 7. We Look So Different Right, so what's the deal with this bipedal thing? How come everything else on the planet has remained perfectly happy with a low centre of gravity and a sturdy base, whereas we wobble around on two legs? Perhaps it's just because we're looking at it from the inside, but you have to admit that we tend to stick out a bit. Two legs, extremely fine coat, hair growing out of odd places, opposable thumbs, huge heads, big, flat feet. We look much more like aliens than natives. Silver points to our lack of body hair as a particularly odd feature of humans. It is necessary for humans to wrap themselves in furs of other animals, just to stop ourselves freezing to death, even on the hot African plains where we're supposed to have evolved. The theory is that perhaps on our home planet the temperature didn't fluctuate so much between night and day and at different latitudes. Possible reasons for this could be a thicker cloud layer that insulates a planet, a bit like on Venus, a binary star system so that the sun effectively never sets, or even that the crust of the planet is much thinner, allowing the heat from the molten core to come up through the ground. As a weird side note, our relatively high levels of subcutaneous fat and almost total hairlessness, as well as our bipedalism, actually makes us excellent swimmers. Maybe we were some kind of race of semi-aquatic dolphin people on our home planet. Number 6. We're too advanced. The most conspicuously different feature of the human race is just how much more advanced we are when we're compared to the rest of life on Earth. Why are we so far ahead of every other animal? It sounds like classic human arrogance, but for all our talk about how intelligent dolphins are because they can recognise themselves in a mirror, they didn't invent the bloody mirror, did they? Okay, how about if we argue that inventing things like wheels and mirrors and social media executives isn't necessarily an indicator of intelligence? It's still drastically different to what everything else on the planet is doing. Why are we such outcasts from the natural world? It could be because it's not our natural world. If we arrived on a primitive Earth with a head start, it could explain why we appear to be leaps and bounds ahead of every other species. Dr. Silver also cites the fact that the missing link that would connect us with our common ape ancestors is still… Uh, missing. I mean, it's not, but never mind. We could have come from a planet where a number of species were similarly advanced. Perhaps that's even the reason we left, to go and rule elsewhere. It all seemed to happen at once, too. Evolutionary speaking, it took us freaking ages to get the hang of sharpened rocks and then all of a sudden we invented agriculture, writing, language, arts, electricity, machinery, chemistry, quantum physics, and pretty much everything else around us today. What the hell happened? Number 5. We can't sleep. One of Silver's arguments is that the human circadian rhythm is out of whack with the actual day-night cycle on Earth. The circadian rhythm is the thing that regulates your sleeping and eating patterns. It means that you're tired at night and awake in the morning, and it's the reason why you feel jet-lagged after a long-haul flight. As the Earth's day and night cycle lasts for around 24 hours, not including leap seconds because, come on, it would make sense for our circadian rhythm to also be on a 24-hour cycle. But it's not. Dr. Silver uses the argument that the human circadian rhythm is a 25-hour cycle, meaning that it makes more sense that we should have evolved on a planet with a 25-hour day. Unfortunately, Silver is wrong with the 25-hour figure, but not about the fact that it doesn't match up. It used to be thought that our circadian rhythm was a whole hour off. Turns out it's actually anything from a quarter to half of an hour off. 
This doesn't seem like much until you realise that, providing you stuck to your natural circadian rhythm, it would only take you a month to be potentially seven hours out of whack. That's a whole night's sleep for most people. This means that our home planet could have been slightly bigger than Earth in order to have a longer day. Although, again, it's not quite that simple. Number four, we don't like it here. Evolution generally means that a species adapts to its environment, but we don't seem to want to play that game. A big part of the theory comes down to the fact that we've altered the planet to fit us, rather than the other way round. We just can't seem to bear living in the natural world. The fact that we have altered our environment so drastically makes it seem as though that we're just not suited to living in the Earth's natural habitat. In fact, what we're doing appears not to be evolving so much as terraforming. Another of Silver's arguments is that we're seemingly terrible at reading our own planet. Many animals have built-in sensors for natural phenomena such as earthquakes, tsunamis, and even just the ability to predict the weather, whereas we have had to intervene with our technology in order to keep up with them. It could mean that we came from a planet that is not so geologically active, meaning that there would be no benefit for us to be able to predict earthquakes. Then we have the fact that we can't eat most of the food on this planet without altering it in some way. Whether it's by cooking it or through selective breeding, most of our food is not as nature intended it. We're not saying that our home planet had hamburger trees and rivers of lemonade. I mean, if it does, then book us a one-way ticket to Alpha Centauri. But the fact that most animals, apart from us, are perfectly fine eating grass and raw zebra is a bit weird. Number three, rapid overpopulation. Humans are spreading, and they're spreading fast. There are over seven billion of us crammed into this tiny little planet, and the number is always going up. Not exactly a balanced ecosystem. It's almost as though we're an invasive species. What happens when you introduce a new species into an environment that they didn't evolve in? A lot of the time, they take over. This is due to the fact that they do not have the natural predators and the local fauna are not equipped to defend themselves against them. This means that the non-native species has free reign to hunt, eat and breed with the potential to decimate the local environment. This does sound an awful lot like how we interact with the natural world. We are so far up the food chain that we don't even feature as the apex predator in it. We actually exist outside of the Earth's ecosystem. It does seem to scream foreign species. Even with other invasive species, the ecosystem will often find a way to restore itself back to normality. With normal imbalances in nature, that balance can be quickly restored again as the food runs out, and the invading species will quickly begin to reduce in number again. This doesn't appear to have happened to humans so far. Perhaps when the resources finally do run out, will go the way of many other species and simply become one rogue algae bloom in the long natural history of the planet. Number two, a prison planet. One of Dr. Silver's slightly more out there theories is that the Earth may actually be a prison colony for a society of galactic beings. It is apparently our naturally violent, vengeful, lustful, criminal nature that makes him think like this. The fact that you don't often observe this kind of behaviour in the animal kingdom makes Silver think that it could well be that these are traits that come from a completely different race of people. The theory is that we could have had our memories wiped and been dumped in a primitive backwater by a civilization of spacefaring beings as a sort of cooling off period, presumably after becoming too much of a menace to intergalactic society. Perhaps they hoped that we would integrate with the natural world on a young planet and become a peaceful race of hunter-gatherers or something, but actually what happened is we almost immediately wiped out Neanderthals and set about transforming the Earth to suit our antisocial ways, so they left us here. To be fair, given our Earth-bound history of shipping criminals off to somewhere out of sight and out of mind, this does sound like exactly the sort of thing that we'd do if we ever became a planet-hopping race of pangalactic beings. The question is, has it already happened? Number one. So where did we come from? In order to figure out our origins, Dr. Ellis Silver explained the practicalities of colonising another planet, and he's certainly given it a lot of thought. If we presume that this ancient race of humanoids has developed the technology to travel at a near light speed, they would need to originate from somewhere that can be travelled within a human lifetime, say 30-ish light years away. Silver reckons that these early settlers could well have brought frozen embryos with them to kickstart the whole breeding process, as they would have been elderly by the time they arrived, although this does ruin the whole Earth is a space prison thing. Dr. Silver then goes on to list his top picks for our potential homeworld, including Alpha Centauri A and B, that's one light year away, Epsilon Eridani, 10.5, 61, Cygni A and B, that's 17, Epsilon Indy, 20, and Tau Cite, that's 22. Do let us know if one of those names stirs something primordial in you, it could be the proof we need. The Alpha Centauri binary system claims the top spot due to its proximity and the fact that it's a binary system. Remember our earlier discussion about how the sun will never set? 
it would mean that, at even a fraction of the speed of light, it would still be reachable within one lifetime. Although fair-minded as always, Dr. Silver also allows the idea for a race of galactic beings could well have harnessed the use of hyperspace and wormholes in order to reach our humble little Earth from pretty much anywhere in the universe. That narrows it down to literally anywhere then. Well, would you look at that? You got all the way to the end of the video, and your mother said you'd amount to nothing. What are the chances? While you're here, why not watch one of our other many, possibly quite good channels, or watch another video which will be largely in the same vein as the quality content you've just endured. Go on then.